We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this uh, discussion on what I hope will be a really uh, engaging conversation around uh, what it looks like for us to transform uh, education in the country, move beyond just reforming, kind of uh, making changes to our existing system, but really what does it look like for us to transform uh, education as we move forward, and what's the role that philanthropy and investors can play in helping to lay the foundation for that transformation. As I think about transformation in education, uh, there's an anecdote that I heard recently that comes to mind, and it's about a mother in Philadelphia. And she uh, was uh, tired uh, with some of the way in which uh, her kids were engaging with the education system and kids in her community uh, and their needs not necessarily being met uh, through the options that were available to them. And uh, she sat down uh, one day uh, and pulled out her phone because she had an idea. And she had an idea about something different, something she could do uh, in her community, something that she could try in her community. And so she sat down to feed her baby and she pulled her, her phone out and somebody had let her know that there was funding that could be available to folks just like her uh, to pursue new ideas in education. And so while she was sitting there feeding her baby, she pulled out her phone, she filled out a funding application, uh, hit submit, and within a matter of weeks, she had capital in her account and was trying something new. And to me, that's a great anecdote of what it means to transform education. And so we're gonna dig into that a little bit more. I'm excited. Uh, to be joined by our panelists. My name is Derek Johnson. I'm the executive uh, director of the Stand Together Trust, uh, joined by Meredith Olson, who's the president of the Vela Education Fund. Excited to dig into more of the exciting work that Vela is doing, uh, really challenging the status quo as we think about how to fund uh, and ensure entrepreneurs, education entrepreneurs, everyday entrepreneurs have the capital necessary to pursue new really exciting ideas in education. And joined by Todd Rose, uh, best-selling author, co-founder, president of Populous. Uh, and I just wanna jump right in. And so Todd, um, I think it'd be great just to level set, maybe take a moment to talk really quickly around what Populous does, because uh, I think that'll set the stage for some of the insights that you guys have been mm -hmm. driving and, and surfacing, uh, not just about education, but more broadly around where the public is in the country right now. Sure. Um, so excited to be here. Um, at my think tank Populous, among other things, we focus on what's called private opinion research. So as many of you could imagine, what people are willing to say out loud isn't always what they privately believe, um, especially nowadays. Um, and so we have methods that get around the distorting effects of things like social pressure, complex trade-offs, and those kind of things. Um, and we've been applying those methods to a range of issues, trying to get at the heart of what people truly believe and want, um, including in, in education. Uh, we were fortunate to have some of the largest data sets on private opinion about what people want out of education in the country that started before the pandemic, and we've been collecting waves of data on that during the pandemic, and then we're coming out of it with another wave. So what are some, so based on that, private opinion, not just public opinion, which can be distorted like you talked about, so people's privately held beliefs, really tapping into that. What are some of the insights that you've surfaced on education? Like you said, kind of pre-pandemic, yeah. through the pandemic, kind of where we're at right now. What are some of those insights uh, around where parents and families are at? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things, um, some of which predate the pandemic um, and have been stable all the way through, and then some things uh, that the pandemic has really catalyzed. So when you look at not just what they'll say out loud, but privately, their trade-off priorities for their kids' education and the general public, what you see is a pretty remarkable shift towards something that's far more individualized, like probably not surprising to people in the audience, like parents all over the country, the public gets there's no such thing as a typical kid, that people have distinctiveness, that that matters. Um, they want that, they want to focus on the whole child and they want school to be about the development of a kid's potential rather than the sort of batch processing and, mm -hmm. and sorting. That was true before the pandemic and it's, it's held all the way through. What's really interesting is they're pretty fed up with the status quo in private, right? So for example, during the pandemic, before, early on in the pandemic when parents didn't even know where they would send their kids, what they were gonna do with them, we asked parents, look, when we figure this out and get back, should we spend our resources and time 
going back to the way it was and make it better, or should we reimagine education fundamentally? Two-thirds of parents across all demographics, even when they didn't know where they were going to send their kid tomorrow, said reimagine the system. And so, so he, that's the first thing. And we can talk about sort of yeah. some of the, the, the obstacles there to, to getting to what they want. What's changed in the pandemic, though, is before the pandemic, if you asked parents about their role and sort of like how much control they had and should have, they were fairly passive and actually felt like their voice didn't matter and there was really nothing you could do. So they weren't very optimistic that change could happen. That's fundamentally been altered by the pandemic. And uh, you know, across, not just in education, but in education too, if there's one trend that's emerged from our, our data, it's this sort of end of compliance culture. And that can be good or bad, but people are fed up being told what to do. Parents have had control foisted on them, right? Okay, tag, you're it. And now they're not ready to give it back and they're unwilling to. And so to me, I'm looking at this and saying, okay, people want different, not better. They want a different purpose for education and they know they do. Um, I can say just a couple of things about yeah, the, please. probably the single biggest obstacle, um, the two obstacles, and we'll talk about the, the big one, which is how do you actually then solve for the, a solution that actually meets this new need. On the mindset side, the biggest obstacle we've found, and it's, um, it's not like I'm plugging my book, as I say in my new book, that's uh, <laughs> what my publisher tells me. I have to say it three times uh, each public event. It's called Collective Illusions. Collective Illusions. It's an <laughs> amazing book. You should check it out. Anywhere books are sold um, the, is this idea of a collective illusion, which is, just briefly, it's that in majorities in a group can end up going along with things that they privately don't agree with simply because they incorrectly think that most people in the group actually do want the old status quo. In education, we've seen collective illusions in many parts of society right now. There are no bigger collective illusions than in education right now. So all the stuff I just said about wanting something different and being able to articulate it, that, that's true and it's stable. Yet when we ask them, not what they think, but what do you think most Americans would say? These people are completely convinced that they are a tiny minority in society. They think that the supermajority of Americans are perfectly happy with the status quo. And so we've got a problem. Like if you really believe most everyone's against you and is happy with the thing that you don't want, how likely are you to like advocate for change? So on our end, we're working hard to, to shatter those illusions to help parents and the public reveal their shared values for the future of education. Um, but that's only half the equation, right? Like just wanting, having hope that it could be better is not the same as having an expectation that it'll change. And I think that's you know, what we're here to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So just, there's a, you just covered a ton of ground, right? So I wanna just, I wanna take a second and, and unpack some of that, right? So some of these key insights. Um, parents want something different uh, they've wanted something that's individualized, and they've wanted that before the pandemic mm -hmm. and through the pandemic, but they're not satisfied with uh, tweaks on the margin. They want something that's different. And I think it's pretty remarkable what you just said, not even knowing what different could be, they're open to, what, they're open to that, that possibility and they wanna pursue that. Maybe you also mentioned that uh, parents in the country are kind of fed up with compliance culture. Mm -hmm and they're moving away from that. There's potential upside to that, there's potential downside to that. Maybe let's just like park there for a second, let's expand on that. So first, what do we mean by compliance culture, and what do you see as the up potential upside and the potential downside? I, I think this is the biggest potential upside and biggest risk for the country right now, which is the, what I mean by the end of compliance culture um, is that across all our data in almost anything we ask and talk about, and we're not the only ones studying this, people are sick of being told what to do. They're, they're, there's a little bit of the anti sort of authority aspect to that. They, they feel like they have better trust in themselves to make decisions. They want things closer to their community. Um, and it's not just, we're seeing it manifest now, right? You're seeing whether in Virginia, parents saying, actually, I do think I should have a say in my kid's education. Um, and I'm willing to, to vote that way. Um, to San Francisco, 
um, and there's school board issues. I mean, you're seeing this across the board, and here's the problem. Well, I think it's good that we're ending this sort of standardized society that we've had for 100 years where there's smart people who make decisions for everybody else and we're supposed to be grateful for that. Um, we don't really have the habit of what it means to r take back control and do it in a way that's constructive. And so, you know, you could imagine it, if we get the conditions right, this sort of end of compliance culture ends up laddering up to something like self-determination, right? a bedrock principle of like, I can be trusted to make choices for myself, for my kids, I think you can, and then we can get somewhere really, really productive. But absent those conditions, I think it's just as likely, if not more likely, to end in just rank populism. That it's like, okay, we may not follow the leader anymore, but we'll follow the tribe, right? And so I think it's really important, if we're even half right about this shift away from compliance culture, that we better get working hard to create the conditions, especially in education, that allow this shift in values to be constructive rather than destructive. Yeah. So speaking of the conditions, right? So Meredith, I wanna pull you into this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe first, just from a level setting standpoint, why don't you clue folks into what's the Vela Education Fund? Give us some of the background there and, and what you guys are doing. Sure thing. So. Um the Vela Education Fund could not have been launched at a better time, just given the conditions that we're describing, given how values are more and more, um, they're changing, but they're held in common, and uh, they're different than what our current education systems offer. So what is Vela and why does it exist? So Vela, um, Vela exists to invest in everyday entrepreneurs, in families, in community leaders, in educators, and entrepreneurs who are reimagining education in new ways outside of traditional environments. Now, what we see in common is that, look, what's the purpose of education? We see that the purpose of education is to enable every single person to have the right kind of experiences, um, to develop into the person they wanna be, to live a life of meaning and purpose. And so this is what we see when Todd talks about the values that he sees in his survey work, this is what we see people wanting for education but they're getting something different from their existing systems. And these existing systems can offer something that's better in touch with their values. But in order to do that, it's gotta transform. And so while we believe that transformation can happen in a lot of ways, in a lot of different places, both in systems, outside of systems, Vela is investing in permissionless innovation that's happening outside of traditional environments. Now what does that mean? So when we talk about permissionless, that's I'm not even sure it's a, a word in the dictionary, but it's a great way to describe <laughs> the work that's happening. Meaning, permissionless innovation is when innovators are able to offer services and solutions without requiring the blessing of anyone. Without requiring the blessing of public officials, of funders, of people in power. So who are they, how are they doing this? Who are they innovating for? Well, they're, they're innovating for the families and the kids who are in their care. So they're innovating for the customers, right? And so Vela exists to support them such that they can learn and grow and improve. And we see the very things that Todd was describing. We see innovators who are self-determined, who are autonomous, who are, are operating with humility, who wanna get better, who wanna learn and improve, but they wanna do it in response to the needs of the customers in their care, the children and the families who are in their care. So to date, Vela's been up and running for two years. To date, Vela has awarded more than 1,300 grants and micro-grants to innovators all across this country. Absolutely. And I'm betting you're gonna ask me, who are these people? Absolutely. Right? Where are these people? Meredith, who are those people? <laughs> who are those people? Well, they're, they're everywhere. So per, it turns out, Permissionless innovators in education are in every community. They are urban, they are rural, they are suburban, they are in all 50 states, they are in every US territory. So we see them wherever we go. And Vela is committed to finding them, bringing them together, and offering them the ability to connect, to build their capacity, to connect with other people, to create a community, to become a tribe. Right, and a tribe that's aligned around these shared values of what can we do to ensure that every child is on their path to living the life they wanna live, a life of fulfillment, a life of purpose, 
Um, so that's what we do. That's why we do it. That's what drives us. Yeah, Meredith, I think it'd be great if you could, what's, what's an example of uh, one of the innovators, the entrepreneurs, their idea that you all are investing in? And maybe give, give us a sense of what are you actually investing? Because I think this is actually really fascinating, right? And, and when you think about traditional philanthropy and what grant making looks like, uh, I was blown away as I've learned more about the approach uh, that you're taking at Vela and just the dollar amounts that you're talking about. Sure thing. So we invest in a wide variety of opportunities, right? So I'll class them in a couple ways just to, to make it digestible. So we invest in entrepreneurs who are leading small learning environments. It could be micro schools, could be cooperative learning communities, could be hybrid homeschool environments, lots of different variations. For example, Vela invested in an organization called the Green Gate Children's School. Green Gate, before we met Green Gate, uh, Green Gate was serving 10 kids in an outdoor learning, um, play-based micro school environment. In order to expand and grow, Green Gate needed money to make their fence bigger so that they could have more outdoor space to accommodate more kids. So Vela offers a small micro grant, $10,000 grant, they're able to relocate their fence. Since that time, in the two years since this has happened, Green Gate grew from serving 10 kids to serving 37 kids to now serving 59 kids. So they have, what, six-fold increase in the number of kids served because they needed, they needed some money to afford some lumber to expand their fence. Yeah, I, what I love about this, uh, this example is oftentimes, uh, it, it's counterintuitive because I think a lot of the time with philanthropy, uh, and, I, and I say this running an organization that, that, uh, that you would consider institutional philanthropy, um, one, oftentimes the groups come with what they think the answers are, what they think the solutions are, and I guarantee pro no program officer anywhere in the country is thinking, oh man, we could have a transformative impact on families in Wichita if we help them move a fence. So this, right. is, this is crazy to me. So you're seeing, you're, this is the kinds of things you're investing in, and it's not that you're saying, cool, we need to help them move a fence, but they're coming to you and saying, I need some money, I can serve more kids, what I need the money for is moving this fence. Absolutely, and what we see is we see folks who are on the ground in their communities closest to the families and kids they are serving, they know what their needs are. You know, no, I don't care how smart you are as a funder, you're not gonna know the needs of the families and the children better than the folks who are, are tending to them every single day, right? So whether it's Green Gate Children's School or whether it's, I mean, we have, we, we have another um, entrepreneur we support, his name's Tony Weaver. He has a company called Weird Enough Productions and he really wants to reach young students of color and his medium is through online comic books, right? And he's delivering educational comic books to kids online and they're featuring superheroes who are students of color. I mean, it's an amazing product. He grew, he started out small, we, we helped support him early on. He's now reaching more than 400,000 students across the country. And we provided a little bit of support at the front end. He's now received downstream funding from other, other funders who are enabling him to expand his reach and impact. So these are the kinds of success stories that, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's, there's 1,300 social entrepreneurs who are growing their businesses, who are leaning in and serving customers in unique ways, and doing it on their own terms without, without us as philanthropists dictating how they're going to deliver that work. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna make a plug because I see a couple questions up here and I wanna pull these into our conversation as we go. So please submit questions uh, through the app uh, and, and send them up. But one of the questions uh, up here I think is, is really I think it's consistent with or, or, or kind of challenged some of the, the narrative that I think has developed through some of the work you're doing, right? Investing in, in some cases, uh, smaller um, kind of pods, micro schools, co-ops, co-learning environments, that part of that narrative is these uh, options don't work for all families uh, in the country. Uh, they only work for a subset of families, privileged families, uh, families of certain income levels, kind of so on and so forth. 
And I think that the question on here is, is, is really great. How do we ensure individualized education remains unbiased and inclusive uh, for the needs of all students? Uh, so again, Meredith, what's been, I don't know, Todd, I wanna get your thoughts on this as well, but Meredith, what, uh, what have you seen 1,300 uh, new ventures and entrepreneurs that you've invested in over the last two years, what have you seen and how do you respond to questions like this where this doesn't work for all families? That's right, and you know, there, there is definitely a popular narrative that's out there that suggests these unconventional learning environments are primarily serving affluent families, they're serving suburban families, they're suburb serving primarily white families, and I would counter that, you know, we can only go based on our experience, and our experience has been remarkably different. So we see incredible diversity among our applicant pool. We see incredible diversity among, among the, the grant recipients who do receive awards. So more than half of VELA awards are given to applicants of color. We see, I mean, we see, we ask our, our applicants, you know, why do you do what you do, and how will this enable you to serve more kids? And what we see is deeply felt, deeply held commitment to increasing access, such that those who couldn't otherwise afford it will be able to afford to participate in these types of learning environments. So what we see, I would say, on the ground every day contradicts maybe what, what some have heard in the popular media narrative. I do think there's additional research and exploration that needs to be done in that area. And we do ask, one of, one of the things Vela does, Vela gives money in a trust-based way, but we ask um, grant recipients to come alongside us voluntarily and participate in research. And so we conduct studies regularly, we conduct research and surveys regularly, and we ask them, you know, are you serving um, students of all, all income? Are you ensuring access? What are the values that you're, you're leaning into? How do you understand student success and measure student success? And we're getting a very rich data set that shows us that yes, there's access for, for students of, of all income levels. Yes, there's rigorous academic work that's being performed. And so I think, I mean, just to respond to some of your, your yep. questions there, Derek, I think our actual experience that we see is a little bit different than maybe um, what you hear in, in the popular narrative. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And I think, I mean, that's been, is, a, is a working an organization that provides funding um, to unconventional, out of system learning opportunities, especially through the pandemic, really helping scale those opportunities and drive more access. That's been our experience, uh, our experience as well. Todd, I wonder how, you, how do you respond uh, to this yeah. question? I, I think it's a great question, right? Because there's like almost no chance that education doesn't become more individualized. Just it, it's part of the trend we're seeing in all aspects of society, right? Like my in a prior life, I was a professor and my, my area of expertise was the science of the individual and, and, and modeling that, not just in, in learning, but in everything from nutrition to genetics to cancer treatment. And like, if you think about all across society, even like right now, if God forbid you got cancer and I offered you the choice between the gold standard average based treatment or molecular fingerprinting and precision treatment for you, there's no one in here taking the average based treatment. Because you recognize there's something about your distinctiveness that actually matters. Um, and this is held everywhere we've looked. Um, I'll give you one example, just because it's my favorite example. I don't own any stock in the company, but um, so uh, in, in the area of nutrition, so in, you know, I, I, growing up, I'm always worried about diabetes that runs in the family. And um, my, we use the glycemic index, right? To tell us like what foods will elevate our blood sugar well, that glycemic index is all based on group averages. And some of my colleagues of mine in Israel use this science of individual to look at, well, how many people does this glycemic index apply to? Zero. Turns out, like, hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, nobody responds the way the glycemic index says you should. Now, that sounds like chaos, but in fact, they were able to use technology and some machine learning to actually create highly predictive, optimized, nutritional guidance for every individual. So I actually participated in it, and I, it's shocking how accurate it is. So uh, I'll give you just one quick thing. So for 20 years, my nutritionist said, grapefruit is so good for regulating blood sugar. On, on, on average, it is. I get my results back. Grapefruit is literally the single worst thing I can eat. 
it spikes my blood sugar more than chocolate cake, which I told my wife meant I should have more chocolate cake. Absolutely. She said, I don't understand how this works. But like, um, for her, it didn't, right? And so what's so interesting is as we get to this recognizing people's distinctiveness matters, it's not chaos, it's not a free-for-all. We will get to better insights. But here's the thing, when, when you take that um, and you can get scale, so my point there is, there's an app on my phone that allows me to optimize my own blood sugar and everybody who has access to that can do the same thing. And we don't have to have one size fits all. Education, every educator on the planet knows kids are different and those differences matter. For the first time, we have the ability to meet educators where they are as experts and build systems around them that are responsive to that. The question about how we make sure that it is actually like done in, in a fair way, because it, it's pretty straightforward as far as I'm concerned. Number one, it cannot be done in a top-down way. It just can't. Because if I wanna, if I wanna take insights about individual kids, which we know, there's two ways we can deal with this. I can top down it, get some smart people, we put it into the, we have smart algorithms, and it's like, it, that is the most dystopian thing you could possibly imagine, right? It is just manipulative, and everyone's thanking them for it, because it's personalized. That is the worst possible solution. So your only other alternative is to think from the bottom up, and I, I think that basically, for me, this means trusting communities, and that's more than just saying that, right? You have to do stuff like Vela is doing and actually put your money where your mouth is. Trust communities, trust individuals, trust families, um, and, and build from the bottom up a, a pluralistic system that is capable of being responsive to the diverse needs of students, families, communities. And so a lot of this, like even this kind of way of investing, feels scary and weird, but that's just because we've lost the habit, right? And when you think about trusting one another, trusting each other, investing in each other. This is the way forward. Um, I, I don't know any other way that doesn't end with us hyper-controlling everybody in a top-down way. So just building on that, because we, we, have a, we have a standardized system. We have education is largely based on a standardization covenant, right? Uh, we largely treat all kids generally the same way through the system. We have similar expectations of them. Um, you know, Meredith, I hear what you're talking about, and the way I opened this conversation was to move beyond just conversations around how to, quote unquote, reform, make a little bit better our education system, but what does it mean to transform our education system? So I am really excited about the results that we're seeing through Vela, 1,300 applicants, 1,300 new ventures uh, over the course of the last uh, two years, uh, I think what you told me was serving uh, well over two million students um, uh, and learners over the course of that period, which I think is really exciting. How does that translate, not saying, and I know you wouldn't say this, that Vela is the thing that's gonna transform the education system, but what have you learned through your work and through this approach that you and Todd are talking about that gives you insights around what does it mean to transform and how we transform our education system moving forward? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what does it mean to transform education moving forward? Well, look, I mean, if we transform education with a new purpose in mind, then we've got, I mean, number one, that has to tap, tap into the deeply held values that people have. I think it does. It's got to um, drive change. If we can highlight examples, if we can identify people who are pushing the envelope, who are showing how to do that, um, then that will motivate change, not only out of system, but also in system. And so Todd, I know you talk a lot about, you know, change happens on the back of rising expectations. So if we're able to convert these deeply held values that people have about what education can and should be into expectations for what education solutions offered, that's where I think you start getting movement and momentum. In other words, if you have out-of-system alternatives that are showing the way, if you have in-system solutions that are saying, hey, we want to be more like that, right? And then you're meeting the needs of more and more families, then I think you can wholesale transform how education is delivered. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to get from here to there. I, I'm encouraged by the openness that we've seen. The pandemic has definitely accelerated 
the openness. Todd, you talked about the, you know, the death of compliance culture, the, the end of compliance culture. People are saying, hey, I don't want to be told what to do, but I do want to learn. I want to try something different. And there's a lot of alternatives that are out there. So I think we're, I mean, we're moving. We're seeing more dynamism in the market than we've ever seen before. Vela's experiencing this demand. We mentioned the 1,300 uh, approved grant applications you have no idea how many thousands of additional grant applications we've received that we haven't been able to award, and that kills us. I mean, but there's demand out there, there's opportunity out there, and we've just got to continue to, to grow and strengthen this work and to strengthen it around these shared values that we've been talking about. The one thing I think is really critical is that is, look, in systems change, there's a really important distinction between reform and transformation. And it, it, by definition, transformation is changing the purpose of the system. And it sounds simple, but if you think about it, take a, something like medicine. So our healthcare system isn't even a healthcare, it's a sick care system, right? Like, it has nothing to do with keeping you healthy. Um, so imagine suddenly we decided what we want is a healthcare system that's about preventative care, right? Mm -hmm. You think about all the downstream changes, even who gets paid, like right now it's, it's the, the people that get paid the most are the ones that are like, the, the tail end of it, like surgeons and things like that. But, it's like lots of stuff changes, everything does. We're at that point in education, I'm telling you, this idea that people want different, not better, is the most consistent finding we, we have. And so no amount of a better mousetrap is actually gonna get public support for, for education, right? The problem with trans transformational change, though, is that unlike reform, which you're keeping the purpose the same, so you can largely do it within the system, Transformative change fundamentally requires a deep connection to culture and communities because you are changing the very purpose, the goals of the system itself. And if they are not closely aligned to the privately held values and priorities of the public, you're going to get in big trouble. Yeah, and so, so getting real specific on this because we've asked, we've asked our, our entrepreneurs in the Vela community, like, what do they value the most? Like, really specifically. Well, so here's what we've learned. You know, academic progress is an underlying expectation for any academic, you know, like any learning environment. So that's a given. But what do they value? What do they value the most? Number one, and we see this across demographics, across geographies, across, you know, like rural, urban, suburban. What do they value the most? Number one, almost across the board, it's they want their child to be known, valued, and included. They want their child to build confidence in himself or herself. It's just the critical value. And then the second thing we see is they, they want their child not to, be, um, not to be a number, not to be pushed through a common system. They want their child to have unique experiences that, they are, that are deeply relevant to them. So these are the things that come to the top of the list. We then see other things, I mean, sort of going down the list, other things like um, they want to have more parental engagement and involvement. They, they like, people like their children. They really do, and they want to be more involved with them. They want to be in, more involved in their, in their education. That has only increased during, during the pandemic. Um, so we've heard a lot of, of media coverage about the anxiety that folks are having, but sometimes you miss the other side of that narrative of, yeah, there's some anxiety, but there's also great joy and great love that's happening by spending more time with your family and with your, with your children. So these are the things that we see when we do our research. Um, do we see a focus on, on academic rigor? Absolutely, of course. But when we talk about the values, it's these other items that go clear to the top. I think, so I'm curious, when we think about, again, transforming the education system, daunting, um, to say the least, but in my mind, based on what, Todd, the insights you have around where the public's at, uh, the appetite for experimentation, the appetite for trying new things, uh, different, not necessarily better, um, all of that is really exciting and I think lays a foundation for what a path forward could look like. How much of a barrier though is um, what, I, what I like to refer to as sort of the imagination problem. So probably just about everybody in the room went to, was participated in a learning environment that basically probably looked the same. It was uh, a traditional school of some kind, four walls of a classroom with a teacher, scope and sequence was probably the same. So how much of the issue that we face moving forward is just an imagination issue because we've never really seen anything different because most of the country has participated in education the same way uh, over the same period of time for 
decades and decades. But that's, I mean, right? So that's this issue of like change happening on the back of rising expectations, not fear. This is it. So I can have hope for something. I can privately want something for my kids. But if I can't, if I've not seen it in real life, I have no real expectation that I should be able to get it, right? Um, and so converting hope to expectation is fundamentally about putting products and services in front of people that deliver on their privately held values and priorities. And what's really powerful about that in terms of the research on how this works is it doesn't have to be a complete in the box solution, right? One full solution. It's, I need to see even bite sized aspects of this. And so for me, like the pandemic did two things that can be productive if we get it right. One is the greatest impediment to most progress is status quo bias. Like the devil, you know, I, I may not like the system, but I know how to behave in it. And the pandemic cut that off. You, you couldn't have the status quo for a while, even if you wanted it. And so they got used to having to see something different, right? And so thanks to, to folks like Vela, a lot of people around the country were exposed to even small things that looked different and felt different. And like at this point, right, that expectation, I mean, we've seen it like in, in a small way where just outside of Boston where I live, parents talked about having a remote learning option for, you know, half a decade. But no one really thought you could have it. It was, it was where they started, we should be able to do it, but like, and then we had it for the pandemic. And then Governor Baker said, everybody back in the classroom. And I, I understand some aspects of that. But like, what was so interesting is the absolute revolt on the part of parents who were like, hold on, you're taking this away. And what was fascinating is it wasn't just parents who wanted to have their kids in remote options. Parents who were like, I'm gladly sending my kid back to school were like, but pa other parents should be able to have this if they want it. That's what I mean. It's like this expectation now. I know you can do it, mm -hmm. you know. And so we've got to avoid the the, I, the the sort of standardized thinking that unless we're investing in the one great solution that will scale to every kid in the country, that this is not worth it. And it's just not true, yeah. right? We don't know enough about what great solutions are going to look like. We need to bet on the very people on the ground cultivating those, right? And even if my view is even if, let's say, nothing out of Vela ever scaled, which I think it will, it would still be worth its weight in gold because it is converting hope into expectation. Yeah. <laughs> Derek, you, you started that thought with something that really struck me, and it was, um, is, there, is there imagination out there, right? And how much, to what degree does this imagination exist? Um, something that makes me so happy about this experience over the last couple of years is the fact that um, my biases have been challenged and I've been proven wrong many times through this journey and we've pivoted how Vela is executed as a result. So meaning, a couple of years ago, um, we thought going in, we had a going in assumption with the creation of Vela that maybe we would be able to find 10 to 15, you know, entrepreneurial uh, opportunities, social entrepreneurs who were developing imaginative approaches um, to delivering education outside of traditional environments, maybe 10 to 15, that would be worthy of investment. And in my mind, and my bias was that there was a limit on the imagination that was out there. What we've learned is that that could not have been more wrong. <laughs> And that's not true at all. And in fact, the creativity and imagination that exists in our community is off the charts. It's everywhere. It's just waiting to be tapped and it's waiting to be un unrestrained and unlimited. So too much of what we do in education is we apply limits. We apply limits to the ability to innovate, limits to the ability to be creative and offer something new and different. And so what we've seen is when you, when you unrestrict the opportunities, Oh my goodness, the cup is overflowing with imagination and creativity. That's how, and instead of investing in 10 to 15 opportunities a year, we're now at, what, six, 700. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. And it's just because it exists, it's in our communities, we've gotta find it and, and we've gotta tap even more. And what, what I think is fascinating, when you talk about what you're investing, in most cases, you're investing $2,500 to maybe $10,000 per opportunity, right? So That's it's right. not as if per opportunity you're investing a significant amount of capital. Your total portfolio is a significant amount of capital, 
but at the end of the day, it's taking, there's a, we're awash with creativity, is what you're saying, and it's taking just a little bit of capital to give parents, educators, everyday entrepreneurs an opportunity to try, uh, and that's the thing that's really unlocking this potential. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. So the way we describe what we do at Vela is, is investing in trust-based philanthropy, um, which is a different approach to philanthropy. It means, you know, when, when, when folks apply, we say we believe in you, and we're, you know, yes, take this $10,000, do what you do, and do it, do it really well. And, and, then, and then we'd love to hear, you know, we'd love to hear about how it went, right? And two things happen when you do this. There's two, two, two huge benefits. So number one, um, the entrepreneur who receives that funding, and we hear this all the time, the, the reaction is, you, you have confidence in me? You believe in me? That, that gives me confidence to believe in my idea and go and make it happen. And, and I've never, we hear all the time, I've never received funding from anyone else before, but you believed in me. So this confidence building is massive. The second thing that we hear all the time is, okay, now wait, you're giving, you're giving me this money, what do I have to do? Y you have to go and, and serve the kids and the families that, that you're caring for. Okay, what's the catch? <laughs> there's a catch, right? No, there's not a catch. We want you to, we, we believe in you and we want you to go and be successful in doing what you do. What that does is it gives them the freedom and the creativity to implement as they see best, right? So the two things that we get from this trust-based approach, it's, it's number one, it's confidence building through the roof. Okay, now I know I can grow and expand. I can go from 10 students to 59 students. I can do this. And then secondly, it unrestricts the creativity. I'm not limited. I can do it on my terms the way I see fit to serve the kids that are in my care. I, lo I love this. I love this thought, and I, I want to dig into the implications for philanthropy. Right, so not just the insights of the methods that you're using through Vela, but really the principles that are that are driving uh, your mission and what you're trying to accomplish. Before jumping into that, Todd, I, I'm kind of curious. What do you, Meredith used a term earlier, uh, permissionless innovation, um, and I'm curious what. One, how would you describe what permissionless in innovation is building on what Meredith mm -hmm. shared? And two, what do you see as the implications for uh, philanthropy and for investors in the education space uh, and for entrepreneurs in the education space uh, because yeah. of this concept? Look, if, if you're gonna, to me, permissionless innovation is deeply tied to this broader concept of trust-based philanthropy, right? Which is, again, you're either gonna try to control people because you think you know more than everybody else or you're gonna trust people and empower them. And that, that, that doesn't mean no accountability, it doesn't mean stuff like that, right? That, like those things are not mutually exclusive. But to me, that trust-based investment, permissionless innovation is trust-based philanthropy applied to allowing people to have a say in the outcome, the goal, right? Rather than just how we get there, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an acknowledgement of the deep pluralism that exists, like that, that there just isn't a one size fits all solution and it, it's the same humility that we take when we think about something like an economy where we realize top-down control economies don't work because nobody's smart enough to understand all that complexity. And so we trust each other and we build conditions around that to allow that trust to ladder up to an enormous amount of material abundance, right? So for me, this permissionless innovation feels scary to people. It's like, wow, you're just gonna let people try things? Yeah, yeah. And, and my, Thing that I think is the most important thing, this is like a, a side social spillover benefit of this kind of philanthropy, is if we wanna get to a society that really realizes the promise of democracy, we're gonna have to trust each other. We are. I actually don't care when people say, do you trust the government? I don't need to trust the government. The government should be accountable to the people. We gotta trust each other though. And the problem is, this kind of so-called social trust is at some of the lowest levels ever recorded. Ever since we implemented this top-down, one-size-fits-all approach back in the 1930s, every single generation in this country has had lower levels of trust than the preceding generation. But of course, you're in a system that literally tells you you're not trustworthy. So I think this kind of shift in philanthropy 
to trust-based investments has an actually outsized effect, right? You think about women's like, wait, you trust me. And you're not saying that. You literally gave me money to unlock an opportunity that I believe in. Think about what that tells that person about how society views them, right? And the best predictor of whether someone will behave in a trustworthy way is whether you trust them. <laughs> so I think there's going to be this really interesting potential stealth way to increase social trust through this kind of philanthropy. And the last thing I'll say is this can all sound like it's, okay, so we're going from some scalable approach that may not be optimal to this sort of Lord of the Flies, like anything goes, nothing will scale. But that's just because we've, again, lost the habit. Like, in, in fact, if you think about, um, my think tank did a case study on this, which is the, the biggest transformational change in education ever in this country was the high school movement, if you remember. We actually built a high school a day for 22 straight years in this country, ending by mass educating more people than anybody had ever done in human history. And we did it without almost any federal oversight. It was community by community, recognizing the economy had changed, our values had changed, and we had to build an education system, a school in that case, to meet those needs. And we did that, right? And, and we forget that, that this idea that starting from the bottom up, using trust-based investments, that somehow that doesn't translate into scale, nothing could be further from the truth. We just don't know what all the solutions are right now. And the best way to do it is either for people like me to tell everyone what they have to do, or people like Meredith, go ahead and invest in everybody else. And, uh, and I, I'll bet on Meredith. I would bet on Meredith too, um, <laughs> for the record. Uh, Meredith, you've, so Vela over the last two years, really exciting venture, mm -hmm. challenging the status quo around the purpose of learning, challenging the status quo around philanthropy and how we go about investing uh, and utilizing philanthropic resources. Uh, I know you told me recently that there's been a lot of interest in, so like, what are you doing in the philanthropic community, right? How are you going about doing what you're doing? How are you finding these folks? Uh, what are the mechanics of what you do at Vela? Mm -hmm. and, and so I want to posit and get your, a positive thought and get your reaction to it. The mechanics of what you're doing are actually uh, pretty immaterial. It's the values that you've embedded in the organization and in your partnerships that are the thing that are really driving value. So what are the, so one, agree or disagree. Two, if agree, what are those values? Well, okay, so I would agree that the processes and the mechanics probably are immaterial. However, I will say Vela is a startup organization, and if you've ever run a startup organization, you know that <laughs> putting things like legal and accounting systems and compliance systems in place such that you can compliantly donate money to individuals in whatever organizational form they currently exist, that is no small undertaking. However, that's the mechanics, and you can solve, you can solve for that. Um, what's more important, are the principles that you apply as you are figuring out how to build your business. And that's what's gonna make you or break you because you've gotta be true to your principles and you have to live them in every part of your work. And so, so for us, um, here again, building on, on trust, um, when we started, we didn't, where would we find more than 1,000 people to invest in? We didn't know them. And so we started by, by developing relationships. We had some strong partners. And so when Vela first launched um, in 2020, we initially worked through subgranting partners. So what does that mean? So we had six partners and we had very close relationships with them and we said, hey, we would like to issue micro grants to people who are doing amazing work. Would you come along this journey with us and would you be willing to go out to your networks and offer this opportunity? And they said, okay, well, what do you, what's the catch? How does this work? We'll just solicit your networks, go out, send an email, and if, they, if people apply, we trust you to look at the applicants who apply and make recommendations, send, send us your recommendations and we'll go ahead and transfer the funds to you. And so we did that. And that was how, I think it was our first 450 grantees received their funding. And so, but here's the interesting thing that happened. At that point, we welcomed not only 
these immediate subgranting partners, but also all of the grant recipients who had received funding through them, we invited them into community with us. We invited them to Zoom calls with a lot of pages, right? We, we created a newsletter. We got to know them. We built trust with them. And then in subsequent grant rounds, we said, you know, hey, we would love for, for you to let people you know about these opportunities. And then we, we offered a direct granting opportunity such that we didn't necessarily have to go through an intermediary. And that's how it's built and grown. So now, today, um, in our most recent grant round, more than half of all applicants uh, told us that they heard about us through referral. So they knew somebody who was already a part of the community and they wanted to be a part of the community too. And so, so to us, that's the biggest affirmation of this trust-based approach. It's like, look, man, these people were, were really great to work with. I've learned a lot. I'm building my capacity. I've got confidence to learn and grow. You gotta be a part of this. Kind of cool too, is just uh, riffing on a question that came up online. I don't know about you all, but like even internationally, like there's something going on in philanthropy right now where an acknowledgement that this sort of old control model hasn't really yielded the kind of outcomes that we had hoped and this openness to this idea, whatever we want to call it, but this sense of, and so there are people that are further along in, in, in Atlanta, and I want to, I see Vela as the, the pointy tip of, I, I always want you at the cutting edge of what it means to do trust-based philanthropy, but I, I think this is the sea change. I think, you know, predictions are always risky, but I think this is the shift, and I think philanthropy recognizing its role in society um, through this kind of lens, I think is gonna be one of the more positive things to come out of the stuff we've been dealing with over the last few years. Yeah, and you know, something else that I wanna mention, because I think this is really important, is that when you're, we invest in entrepreneurs, right? And when you are, when you are expanding the scope of what is possible, when you're reducing the amount, when you're expanding eligibility, then, I mean, you're expanding the imagination of who can be a successful grant recipient, right? And so when we think about traditional education philanthropy, oftentimes the, the grant amount is much larger and there's a very defined set of requirements. So let's say the minimum grant amount is 500,000 and you've gotta produce you know, um, an evidence-based track record of success with a proven ability to scale and you need longitudinal data and you know, basically you've been in operation for a long time, you are dramatically reducing the, the types of people who are, are going to be able to successfully make it through your filtering process, right? And in doing so, you're limiting the innovative potential because you're limiting the people. By doing uh, philanthropy in this way, executing philanthropy in this way, almost anyone can be an entrepreneur. And we do ask people, we ask them how they self-identify our applicants. Do you identify as an entrepreneur, as a teacher, as a parent, as a community leader, and there are many people, trust me, who could check every single one of those boxes, but we find that a plurality, the greatest response rate is for people saying, I'm an entrepreneur, that's who I am. And so I feel like we're, I mean, from like an, an equity standpoint, we're increasing access, we're increasing opportunities for people to define themselves and go be a successful entrepreneur. Well, to your point, right, so look, think about, it. if we've made all these hoops, that people have to jump through. Who does that disenfranchise the most, right? I mean, it, it, without realizing it, we are perpetuating inequalities that this kind of trust-based investment at least has the chance to actually overcome. And so for me, I get a little, I, this, is, this is me riffing now, like I'm speaking for, I get frustrated when our knee-jerk reaction to trust-based philanthropy is like, it's, well, is it gonna help so and so and so and so? It's like, yeah, like, it, realize it or not, the control mechanism we put in place may be the biggest obstacle to true equity in this stuff than anything else. And uh, you look at it even in the work you've already done. I mean, the, I'm always impressed by the number of entrepreneurs coming from marginalized communities doing amazing things. Um, and if I, if I was putting a bet on what ends up being a home run, I'm telling you the innovations that come from the margins are always the best innovations, so always. So see, here's the thing, if you want that home run, do you only want to invest in people who are already on third base? <laughs> right. Or do you want people who are running right. towards first? So 
We have a little bit of, a little bit of time left. I want to get to a couple of the questions that are on here uh, and, and quick responses to them. But before jumping to that, I think one of the challenges that I hear from folks uh, in the philanthropic world uh, and in the investing world is, is trust-based philanthropy, is this trust-based approach, this believe in people approach. Um, is it just sort of willy-nilly anything goes? Uh, what about the fiduciary responsibility I have for the funds that I'm responsible for? Um, what about accountability? What about results? How do you respond to that? How do some of those ideas come together? So these are the hard questions at the end, right? Um, so look, hey, we're trying to reimagine the purpose of education. We're trying to move away from standardized scope and sequence. We're trying to expand the conception of what that means. And so um, what you won't find at Vela is you won't find a common benchmark. There's thousands of different ways to deliver education. We do ask, how do, how do our grant recipients evaluate success? How do they measure student performance? They, they pursue a lot of different methods. They, they use competency-based assessment. That's, that's pretty popular. They do um, observations of student performance. They do interviews with families and with students. They um, evaluate portfolios of work. They do projects and look at projects. They do productions. There's a lot of creative production that's going on. So they do a lot of the things that we, we used to do in traditional education before the standardized testing mania began. Right? But guess what, guys? That's really hard. That takes a lot more time and effort and a lot more work. So that's happening. Um, I think one of the strongest signals, and it's a, an underappreciated signal of whether or not something is working, it is demand. Meaning, parents, and we know this, we know this from the values, parents care deeply about their children. They want their children to have access to a better life than they had. They care deeply about their children's education. If you have a learning environment that has increased its population from from 10 kids to 45 kids to 60 kids, they're doing something right. And how do we know that? Because if they weren't, those parents would be leaving. Okay? And so we have faith because we, we stay in touch with our, our grant recipients and we ask them how things are going. Do they all succeed? No. No, they don't all succeed. Some of, some of them fail. But man, I got to tell you, we see so many that are growing and thriving. And so we talked about scale a little bit more. Um, this isn't one single approach, you know, that's, that's the center of like a hub all across the country. This is a distributed network of small, local, organically grown educators who are collectively scaling. They're tripling, they're quadrupling their, their reach and impact. I would argue that, you know, it's very difficult for a school to double, triple, or quadruple their student body unless they're doing something right. We're seeing thousands of people doing something right. Absolutely, I love it. Uh, Todd, uh, what's your final word on this topic? Meredith, I'm gonna ask you the same question. What do you want folks to walk away from this conversation with? Uh, look, I, I think we're in the midst of a pretty profound change in this society and we're experiencing a lot of the bumpy parts, right? But most transformational change has bumpy parts and you know, I, I believe my think tank has as much if not more private opinion data on the American public than anybody else and I'm telling you, something has changed. There, there is a set of shared values about what we want a free society to be and we are being held back by a combination of these collective illusions that have led us to see division where there's unity um, and, and we know how to solve for that. And then we're being held back by a lack of clear sense of expectation driven by being able to see the things in real life that we actually care about. And so I think that we're on the cusp of something pretty great. I know it seems like there's a lot of problems, but I think we're gonna get somewhere pretty, pretty remarkable. And I think it's actually gonna be education that's showing us the way forward rather than being the lagging um, institution. Meredith? So, Communities, I believe that communities that have shared values strengthen as they grow. And man, I gotta tell you, this community of Vela innovators who are committed to shared values around making sure that every child can develop into the unique human being that they were meant to be, I think that's something that's a tribe we should all wanna welcome others into. This is a tribe of permissionless innovators. I wanna welcome everyone here to this tribe. And I want to see this tribe continue to strengthen and grow. 
some of the, some of the phrases that I heard, so just in, in summation and wrap up, some of the phrases that I heard here, um, a lot about trust. Um, I might talk about that in language of believing in people. People are capable of extraordinary things when they have the freedom and the opportunity to, to pursue them. Uh, rising expectations, that change happens on the back of rising expectations. And that parents are looking for uh, different, not better. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, we need to empower people to try new things and really embrace this notion of permissionless innovation. And that this is what's gonna help us transform our education system as we move forward. And if you're an innovator, an entrepreneur, which I think everybody in the room is, if you've got an idea, talk to Meredith about it. Uh, talk to us, the folks at the Stand Together Trust about it. Uh, we love to hear uh, new and interesting ideas and think about how we can partner together uh, moving forward to continue to push the envelope for what good looks like, what better can look like in education as we move forward. Thank, thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Todd and Meredith. Thank you.